Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to James chapter 4. We're going to deviate from our study uh, in 2 Corinthians this morning, uh, substituting for uh, Shane this morning. He had a whirlwind trip, I think, up to Indiana, and uh, wasn't sure if he was going to make it back, but we're glad he he did, but I'm sure he's wore out uh, from doing that in one day. He said it'd be fine to do it, continue, pick up where he left off last week, but I decided during the course of the week that I'd just do something different. That way he can pick up with the material that he already has prepared, and even better, doesn't have to straighten out anything I mess up when he gets up here next week. But if you will, uh, let's begin reading in James chapter 4, get a little context from, for what we want to study our time together this morning. James 4 says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you can commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. There's probably a a dozen or maybe even a couple dozen things in there that would make a study in and of themselves. But this morning, I'd like for us to focus upon the simple statement that's made there in verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You know, when we want to look at what does it mean to draw near to God... If you, if you open a dictionary, it tells us that this phrase, draw near, is an idiom, meaning that, you know, it's sometimes difficult to determine from the literal words that are used the meaning that is being conveyed. We have a lot of idioms in the English language, uh, things that, you know, unless you know what it means by trying to define each individual word, you wouldn't come up with the same uh, understanding. So it's an idiom, but it means to come closer, to approach. That's what draw near means, to come closer, to approach. The example that the Merriam-Webster Dictionary gives is that he became more nervous as the day of the wedding drew near. So as that day came closer, as it approached, he became more nervous. So we understand that. And so when it says draw near to God, what it's really telling us is come close to God and he'll come close to you. And that's the the rendering that the International Standard Version gives this passage. Instead of draw near, come close to God, and God will come close to you. That's the idea that's being conveyed here with the phrase draw near. You know, we can't in a literal sense, physical sense, come any closer to God than we already are. I think David does a good job in Psalm 139. We won't take the time to turn there, but if you'd like to write that down and read it later, you see there that he, he asks some, some questions that are very pertinent. Where can I go? Where can I flee from your presence? And he lists some places and says, even if I go there, you're there. Your eyes see me. There's nowhere that I can go is basically the conclusion that we draw from Psalms 139 where we are not in God's presence. So we can't come closer in a literal or physical sense, but we can always draw near. We can always come closer in a spiritual sense. And I think that's exactly what James is getting at here in James 4, verse 8. But I think there's about six or seven times in the New Testament, depending upon which translation you're using, the phrase draw near is used. But in Hebrews chapter 4, we see another instance. And let's just begin for the sake of time reading with verse 14. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
Here's one of those six or seven other passages in the New Testament that talks about us drawing near, coming closer to God. So we can get closer to God in a spiritual sense. This morning, I'd like for us to spend the remainder of our time looking at some ways where we, how we can come closer or draw near to God. And this certainly isn't exhaustive. I suppose any lesson, any study, any sermon is never exhaustive. But these are just some ways that I thought of and how we can do what it is James tells us to do in James 4 verse 8, to draw closer to God and he will draw closer to us or come closer to us. One thing that we need to do is to set aside time for God every day. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles. You may recall, I don't know how long ago it's been, uh, that we talked about Asa. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Asa was the third king of Judah. And Asa was a good king, initially. He did a lot of good things. He started off on the right foot, but he, he fell away toward the end. But we see here that in, in 2 Chronicles 15, verse 2, if we were to back up into chapter 14 and read, we see that the Ethiopians come up against Judah. Judah is vastly outnumbered. But Asa turns to God, and Asa prays to God and says, God, be with us. God, with your help, I know that we can be successful, even though it was like, you know, less than half. When you compare the Ethiopian army size to the, the, the size of Judah's army, it, it, was, it was a slaughter in terms of just numbers. But Asa prays to God. Asa looks to God for strength and looks to God for help. And so after this great victory, we see here in 2 Chronicles 15 and verse 2, uh, he says, Now the Spirit of the God came to uh, Azariah, the son of Obed, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you are with him. Think about that. The Lord is with you when you are with him. And if you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And he goes on to talk about how that Israel had forsaken God. But Israel had now turned back to God. But remember that statement. The Lord is with you when you are with him. And if you seek him, he'll let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. You know, sometimes maybe you've seen out in front of a church somewhere, it'll say, if, if God seems far away, guess who moved? There's a lot of truth in that. And that's exactly what Azariah is telling Asa here. God will be with you if you'll be with him. James is saying, if you draw closer to God, he'll draw closer to you. But if you forsake him, he'll forsake you. So when we answer that question, guess who moved? Well, it's always us. Because God is always seeking to draw closer. But it's we who drift away. It's we who fall away. And if we're not actively seeking and striving to draw closer to God, you know, we may think, well, I'll just stay in the same spot. But no, it doesn't happen that way. The Hebrew writer talks about the danger of drifting. And if you've ever been out on the river and you haven't anchored your boat or you don't have your motor on or you don't have your trolling motor going and you're just sitting there fishing, the next thing you know, you look up and you're a long way from where you started. Why? Because the current drifts you away from where you were. The same is true in our spiritual lives. If we're not actively seeking to be closer to God, if we're not trying to make that happen, we're going to wake up one day, or we may not wake up at all, but we're going to be a lot further away from God than we realize or that we intended to be. So the Lord is with you when you are with him. So we need to set aside time for God every day. <clears throat> we need to examine the scriptures daily. That's exactly what we read about <clears throat> in Acts chapter 17. I'm going to try to take the time to turn to, to most of these verses. You'll probably beat me there because I can't talk and, and flip at the same time. But in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, it says, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word of God with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So the Bereans are more noble than the Thessalonians. Why? Because they received the word with great eagerness. They craved it. But what did they do? They didn't just crave it and, and just gobble up anything that was said and anything that was done. No, it says they examined the scriptures daily to see whether the things 
whether these things were so. And that's the way we need to be. We need to examine the Scriptures daily. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, again, a passage that tells us that we have to be diligent. We have to be eagerly seeking. 2, or, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. So we've got to be diligent. We've got to work. We've got to strive to present ourselves approved to God. How do we do that? How how does He tell us that we do that? We accurately handle the Word of God. How can we accurately handle the Word of God if we're not familiar with the Word of God? You know, at work we have procedures for tests. We have documents of requirements. And you can always tell when you're in a meeting the people who've done their homework, the people who, who understand what's in that test procedure because, you know, they don't have to go and read it line by line. They've already looked at it and they've already read it. And they'll point out and say, oh, well, step 15 tells us we've got to do this first. They accurately handle that test procedure. Why? Because they've examined it already. They're familiar with it and they know how to use it. In Romans 10 verse 17, it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Again, we have to examine the Scriptures daily. That's where our faith comes from. You know, we can have faith in in evolution. You want to know how you develop faith in evolution? You examine the documents and the texts that are written by, by scientists and men like Darwin, and then you'll have faith in evolution. But you want to have faith in God's Word? You know where you get that from? From a science book but from God's Word itself. Hearing by the Word of God. In 1 John chapter 2, several years ago, and I may have told you this story before, and I'll probably tell you again, but several years ago, the little church down the road from where we lived in Limestone County, I was headed on my way to work one morning, and I noticed the sign out in front of the building. They always had little sayings up on it in this particular morning. It said, it's good to know the book, but it's better to know the author. And I presume the book they're talking about was the Bible since it was a church, and I assume that they're talking about God being the author of it. But the statement was, it's good to know the book, but it's better to know the author. And I, it crossed my mind, well, I wonder if they've ever read First John 2. 1 John 2, beginning in verse 3, says, By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in it. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this, we know that we're in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. What does John tell me about knowing the author? Can I know the author separate and apart from his word? It's not the way the Bible works. By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. How are we going to keep His commandments if we don't study His Word? How are we even going to know what His commandments are? So we need to examine the Scriptures daily. We need to be devoted to prayer. That's the language that Paul uses there in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. Colossians 4 verse 2 says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. I don't know, I've I've never counted it up, but I don't know the number of times that Paul, when he talks about prayer, talks about thanksgiving. And the importance of when we pray to God, doing it with thanksgiving. I think there's a tendency, I think there's a danger for us often to go to God in prayer and ask God for help and ask God for this and ask God for that. But we never step back and thank God as we should for all that He's done for us. And if, you know, I'm having a bad day and times are bad and things aren't going my way, you know, I want Him to help me in those situations. But do I ever thank Him for the times that He's helped me before, the the difficult things He's helped me through before? Do I thank Him? For the forgiveness of my sins? Do I thank Him for this avenue of prayer that I have? When we go to God in prayer, we have to do it. It says we would keep alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. But we're to devote ourselves to prayer. 
I think the, the Bible study, if I'm not mistaken, Wednesday night, I may be off a, a Wednesday or two, but we talked about prayer. We talked about 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, that says, pray without ceasing. I think that was what Brother Gerald talked about. Pray without ceasing. Continually. A prayer never needs to be far at all from my lips. So in one place we read that we're to be devoted to prayer. In another place we read that we're to pray without ceasing. And of course we know what Daniel did. We won't take the time to turn there. But you know, even once Daniel knew the document had been signed, the decree had been made, to not pray to anyone other but the king. What did Daniel do? Daniel opened his windows, faced toward Jerusalem, and prayed three times a day anyway. We need to be devoted to prayer. Devoted even if we know something bad is going to happen like Daniel. Daniel had to know something bad was going to happen because he's violating the law. But it didn't deter Daniel from doing what he needed to do in order to set time aside for God every day. You know, we need to schedule daily time for God. I've got the word schedule in italics because that's important. Because if we think that, you know, our day is just going to work out to where we're going to have some time, and, you know, if I have some free time, then I'm going to get my Bible out and I'm going to study. Then I'm going to, I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to pray to God. It's never going to happen. Never going to happen. It may happen once in a blue moon, but it's not going to happen daily. Because our days have a way of filling up themselves, don't they? We need to schedule time, and it needs to be Daily. You know, people who train for the Olympics, they don't, you know, train once a month. They don't train once a week. Many of them train daily, every single day, up at the same time, doing the same things. Why? Because they want to be the best in the world. They want to be able to compete on the world stage. It doesn't just happen. As as talented as people are, as, ta as much, you know, God-given talent as some people have, they still have to practice it. They still have to work toward it. They still have to schedule time daily to get better at it. And we need... Yes? I want to make a comment. Huh? You talk about seeing the sign of knowing the author mm -hmm. from the book. Psalms 138, verse 2. It says, You have magnified your word above all your name. It's to know the book. Mm -hmm. To know his word. Mm -hmm. Not just the author. Absolutely. His word has been magnified above. <clears throat> appreciate, appreciate that comment. So I encourage you to discover the times that work. You know, some, some people are morning people and they're the freshest when they get up in the morning and they can do anything. For some of us, you know, we, we drag ourselves across the carpet and our eyes don't open up till 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. But we need to find that time. We need to schedule that time. We need to devote that time to God. And we need to stick to it. Whether we're a morning person or an evening person or a lunchtime person, whatever that, we need to find time to study God's Word. We need to make time. Now, there's going to be opportunities that arise for us to pray, and we should do that, and we should take opportunity. But, you know, there ought to be, we ought to be like Daniel, where we have times that we pray. That we devote that time to God. So we need to set aside time for God every day. That's how we draw closer to God. That's how we get closer. That's how we come closer. That's how we approach God. Another way is to fix our eyes on Jesus. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12, I don't know why I said 2. Right after chapter 11, after we talk about all these great heroes of faith and the things that they did through faith, he begins chapter 12 by saying, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and, let, and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he describes it as a race. And he says in order to do this, we've got to lay aside every encumbrance. You know, 
certain runners may actually put weights on as they run, as they train. So that when the real race comes, you know, it, it feels easy by comparison. But he says when we run this race, we're supposed to lay aside every encumbrance. And, and if there's any confusion as to what he's talking about, he clarifies it and says the sin. The sin which so easily entangles us. Set all that aside. And run the race, he says, with endurance. This isn't going to be a short race. This isn't going to be a sprint. Where if we can just keep it together for 100 yards, we're going to be okay. No, this, this, is, this is going to be grueling. It's like a marathon. After you run those first six miles and you're exhausted, you still got 20 more to go. Run with endurance, he says. The race that is set before us. And then he makes the statement that I want us to focus on. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Sometimes at night I get out and I walk along Hamby Road there up and down in front of mom and dad's house and down around the corner. And I'm sure Artem has seen me walking at night and and sometimes I have a bad tendency to just stare up at the stars. Because I enjoy looking at the stars. I enjoy looking at the constellations. I enjoy trying to see satellites and the, and the International Space Station and looking at the moon and, and all those things. And, and when I do that, I'm all over the road. There's been times I've about ran into the ditch because I was looking up and I didn't realize it and I stepped off and it was pretty deep and I about lost it. There's been other times that I ended up all the way on the other side of the road. Why? Because I didn't have my eyes fixed ahead on where I was headed. I was just wandering, looking around while I did it. You know, if you watch these, these, these sprinters and these races, you know, I think I've only ever seen one that was uh, Usain Bolt who, who actually would like look around at the guys around him, but he was so fast, he knew they couldn't catch him. But most runners don't do that. Most runners are looking at the finish line. They may glance to their side every now and then, but they don't turn their heads. They keep their eyes straight ahead. They don't want to step out of their lane. They don't want to lose speed because they're discombobulated or looking behind them. They set their eyes on the goal. They set their eyes on the finish line. And that's, in a sense, I think what the Hebrew writer is telling us here to do, to fix our eyes on the finish line. Set our eyes on Christ. We need to avoid distractions. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. <clears throat> in Matthew 14 and in verse 30, here we see <clears throat> Jesus walking on the water. And we remember how the story goes. Peter wants to, to meet him. You know, they're, they're scared. They don't know, you know, who this is. And, and he's, if it's you, Lord, you know, let me come out to you. And so he begins to do so, and initially he does just fine. He has no problems. He's, he's looking at Jesus. But I want you to notice in verse 30. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. If we back up to verse 28, it says, Peter said, Lord, if, you, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Now, this is a, a literal story. This is the events that transpire. But I think there's a spiritual lesson here for us, isn't there? You know, while Peter was, was looking at Jesus and was going toward Jesus, he didn't have any problems. But when he started looking around him, when he remembered what he was doing, I'm walking on water. That's, that's unnatural. There's all this wind. He says he began to sink. I think the same is true in our life spiritually. We get distracted. We know what we ought to be doing. We know what we should be doing. We know what we're supposed to do. But, hey, look all around us. It's difficult because, as we're going to read in a few moments, the, th the things that we see all around us are the, the, are the temporal things. But the eternal things, we don't see those things. In, Matthew, or excuse me, in Mark chapter 4, in verse 19, remember here when Jesus was explaining the parable of the sower, he talks about the seed that was sown among the thorns. When he gives the explanation for it, in verse 19, he says... But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Here's somebody who starts with their eyes on Jesus. Here's somebody who starts with their eyes on the finish line. They get distracted. 
He describes these thorns of life. He describes them as the worries of the world. Do we, does anybody here this morning have worries? We all do in some shape, form, or fashion. The worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, that's a big one. And the desires for other things. Boy, that's wide open, isn't it? We have a desire for God. We want to serve Him. We want to please Him. And yet our flesh, our flesh desires other things. So we've got to avoid these distractions. We've got to refocus our attention. Turn back with me to to Matthew, this time to chapter 6. Notice there in verse 19 and 20 and 21, it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A little bit different wording, but the same exact concept, the same exact principle that we're, we're studying here about fixing our eyes on Jesus. We need to be laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven, but what's the problem with those treasures? We, we can't see those. We can't use those right now, can we? But all this treasure here and all the things that it can buy, that's, that's distracting. Now in 2 Corinthians, I got ahead of myself a moment ago, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where, where Brother Rodney did an excellent study for us here uh, uh, a few weeks ago. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's the difficulty in it. It's a lot easier to do something. It's a lot easier to pursue something. It's a lot easier to look at something you can see. And that's why it's so enticing. That's why it's so difficult. But again, we're reminded here not to set our eyes on the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen, the things that are eternal, the things that are really going to matter to us. In the hereafter, there's not going to be a thing on this earth that's going to matter to us. So where is our attention here and now? Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, we sing a a song by the same title, Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. We've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. And we've got to block out. We've got to put the horse blinders on. And it may take a really big pair, but we've got to put them on so that we focus We focus our eyes upon our purpose because that's where we're going to end up. Whatever we set our eyes on, that's where we're going to end up. When I set my eyes on the stars, I end up all over the road and in the field and in the ditch. But when I set my eyes at the end of the road, that's where I end up. And the same is true in our spiritual walks. If we got our eyes fixed on Jesus, that's where we're going to end up. But if we're looking at all the here and now, Sometimes this requires drastic. Sometimes this requires painful measures. You remember what Jesus said in in Matthew chapter 18? In Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 8, he says, If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it's better to enter life crippled or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be cast into the fire of hell. Jesus literally telling us to chop our hands off and pluck our eyes out because we sin with them. I, I don't think so. But I think what Jesus is telling us is it may take drastic measures. We might have to go to drastic measures to keep ourselves from sinning and it'll all be worth it. You know, the problem with chopping my hand off is I still got another one. The problem with plucking my eye out is I still got another one, right? So I don't think Jesus is literally talking about this being the solution for sin. But what he's telling us is we've got to do whatever it takes to put sin aside. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 24. 
Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. There's that idea of, of making sure we're looking where we're going. I box in such a way as not beating the air. Notice verse 27, though. But I discipline my body, and I make it my slave. So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. In order to refocus and look at what we need to be looking at, it may take drastic measures. It may take painful measures. Paul talks about having to discipline his body, having to make it his slave in order to accomplish this. What's distracting you in your service to God? Only you can answer that. Only you can answer that for you. Let's humbly, openly, honestly assess ourselves and determine, are there things that are distracting me? Are there things that are taking too much of my time and too much of my attention away from the things that really matter? And what can you do? What can you do to prevent it? Altogether, maybe. But I realize it's not always possible to completely prevent some things because we still got to live in this world. There's still going to be distractions. There's still going to be worries. There's still going to be cares and concerns and things that we have to tend to. But what can we do to help minimize that, to put it in its proper place? To not give it too much emphasis, to not put it above God and make it our eye. We have to fix our eyes on Christ. Another way to draw near to God is to commit to growth. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17. 2 Peter 3 verse 17. <clears throat> he says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. Just in the previous verse as he talks about there's some things that are, that are difficult to understand. He talks about how the unlearned or the untaught, how they, how they rest or twist these things to their own destruction. And so he says, since you know this, therefore, since you know this beforehand, don't be carried away by the error of unprincipled men. But verse 18 says, but grow. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Instead of being carried away, he says that we need to grow in grace. We need to grow in knowledge. So we have to commit to growth. That's not something that's going to happen. You know, sometimes I think we get this idea that it's easy, right? You put a seed in the ground, you give it some water and some sunlight, and it just grows. And we kind of think, you know, it'll just happen with us, right? We'll just grow. Not unless we work at it. Not unless we strive for it, not unless we make it our focus and our attention and our purpose. We've got to commit to growth. Brother Sam up in Limestone County, who used to come up our way in Virginia for 20 or 30 years, he always had a saying, you're either green and growing or you're ripe and rotting. And I think that's so true. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, this time he says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make your make certain about your calling and choosing about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you'll never stumble. And these things, I take it to be the things that he says that we need to diligently work toward beginning up in verse five. You know, if we ever get to the point where we say, you know what, I've got knowledge. I don't need to work on that. I've got self-control. I don't need to work on that. We're fooling ourselves. We may be better than we were. We may be better than we used to be. But if we think we've got to the point where we don't have to worry about it anymore, we're going to stumble. That's what Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. You know, if I think I've got it down and I think I'm where I need to be, I'm ripe. No, I'm not ripe. I'm rotting. And we need to take this approach that we're always going to grow because we can always make improvements. There's a Chinese proverb that I ran across years ago, and I don't even remember where I ran across it, but it goes something to the effect of the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. And I like that saying. 
And you say, well, what's that got to do with our study? Well, you know, I may look at my life and say, well, I've been a Christian 20 years or 30 years, 40 years or, or more. And I'm not where I need to be. And I may lament that. And I may feel bad about that. But you know what? The next best time to get to where I need to be? Yeah, 20 years ago would have been great. But I don't have 20 years ago. What I've got right now. Best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the next best time is right now. And I believe that's exactly the idea, or, or that sim a similar idea is uh, expressed by the Hebrew writer in chapter 5, when he says there in verse 12, he says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and have not come to need milk, and have rather have come to need milk, and not solid food. That may describe some of us. It describes some of the people that the Hebrew writer was writing to. And we can get down about that and we can get frustrated about that and we can throw up our hands and say, what's the use? Or we can buckle down and say, now is the time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make up for lost time. We've got to start small, but we've got to continually, and I want to emphasize that word, continually move forward. You know, if a person doesn't feel their Bible knowledge is where it needs to be, I, I don't recommend that they start in the book of Revelation. You know, I'm, I'm going to know everything there is to know about the book. That's not the place to start. We start small. And that's, that's again, what we see here in this verse, in verses 13 and 14. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant, but, an infant, but solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. We've got to start small. We've got to start with the milk. We've got to start with the simple things and work toward the chewy things. And the same idea is expressed there in Philippians 3, verse 12, beginning. So I want to ask the question this morning, where are you in your journey? Again, only you can honestly answer that. I can, you know, I can judge you based upon you know, how long you've been a Christian, but you know, that really doesn't tell us a lot, does it? Because I know Christians who've been Christians a long time, but they don't understand things as they should. They're not where they ought to be. And so we've got to ask ourselves the question, where do I want to be? And am I going to commit to getting there? Am I going to commit to start to get there today? Another thing I want us to talk about here just briefly is to invite others to join you. Proverbs 27 verse 17 says that steel sharpens steel. Iron sharpens iron. You know, studies show that we all do better in endeavors when we have a partner to encourage us, to hold us accountable. If you want to lose weight, have a buddy. Have a buddy that's trying to lose weight too, who can hold you accountable to what you eat. And to, when you're sitting on the couch and you don't want to get up and exercise, you can say, come on, let's go exercise. People who have a partner in those endeavors, they lose more weight and they keep it off longer. You know, we weren't meant to go through life alone. We see that in the very beginning, don't we? Genesis 2, verse 18. God made man a help me. In Hebrews 10, verse 24, we're to consider how to provoke one another to love and good works. In Acts 8 and verse 31, we see there that the Ethiopian eunuchs, you know, when, when Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I, lest some, lest some man should guide me? That's, that's the way God designed it. Romans 10 verse 14 tells us that there's got to be a preacher. There's got to be someone there to teach us, to tell us about God's word. And so we need to make sure, maybe I ought to word this one a little bit better. Instead of trusted friends, maybe trusted brethren, trusted Christians, who can, I can invite to join me, to help mentor me, and maybe in some cases who, others that I can mentor to help them, to encourage them, to stimulate them. And then finally, as we're running out of time this morning, we need to remember whose we are. Remember 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 says, we're the temple of God. It also says that we've been bought with a price. We belong to God. So if you become discouraged, you need to remember that God has invested so much in you. John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God has invested a lot in us. Isaiah 53 bears that out as well. Christ was sacrificed for our sins, for our transgressions. Your life is in the hands of someone who loves you. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Let that soak in for a moment. I wish we had time to read Romans 5, verses 6 through 10. I encourage you to do that today. One of my top five, top ten favorite passages in all the scriptures. 
the love that God had for us while we were enemies, while we were ungodly. He wants you to become the person that he created you to be. That's what Romans 8 verse 28 tells us. That's what Ephesians 2 verse 10 tells us. That's what 1 Peter 2 verses 9 through 10 tells us. He wants us to be the person he created us to be. He wants us to be the person that he sent his son to die for. Are we willing to do that? If we do that, I think there's such a great source of encouragement and strength that comes from that to realize that God loves us. And God is patient. And he wants us all to come to repentance. So what steps do you need to take? Maybe it's some of the steps we talked about this morning. Maybe it's setting aside time every day. Maybe we maybe we've slacked off in that. Maybe we did that at some point, but you know, life got busy and 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 you know, all of a sudden here we are not studying as we should be. Here we are not praying as we should be. Maybe, you know, we're distracted. Maybe not even by sinful things. And you know, we tend to think of that as, you know, the thorns as being sinful things. Well, no, I don't think so. The worries of the world, you know, those are just the problems of life, right? We all have those, but they can distract us. We've got to commit to growth. We've got to determine, I am going to grow. I'm going to make it happen. Otherwise, I'm just going to sit and rot. I need to invite others to join me so that I can be an encouragement to them, but they can be an encouragement to me so that we can do this together. You know, we can charge other people's batteries. I've heard that analogy given of charging other people's batteries, boosting all their, their spiritual car, so to speak. And if we do that enough without recharging our own batteries, what happens? We get pretty low too. And we need somebody to boost us. We need somebody to charge our batteries back up. That's the encouragement that we can get from one another as we strive to walk the life that Christ would have us to walk. And then finally, if we become discouraged, we need to remember how much God loves us, how much he has invested in us. So let us do all these things so that we can draw near to God. Apologize for not giving anybody time to, to speak up, but uh, appreciate your, your good attention.